just one minute more and then we start. Okay, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and uh, very welcome to the, uh, this uh, SEPS ECMI webinar, uh, Fostering European Equity Markets, the role of CMU uh, Index. I'm very glad to have uh, an excellent panel of uh, speakers uh, to, uh, to discuss about uh, this issue. Um, Capital Markets Union uh, is an important um, project of uh, flagship project of the European Union. It was mentioned also yesterday in the uh, speech that uh, President von der Leyen um, gave uh, in addressing the state of the union, so completing the capital markets union is an important step uh, more than ever uh, after the, the COVID crisis. Uh, but in fact, the opportunity for having this, uh, this webinar and uh, this discussion about the specific topic of uh, uh, building uh, uh, an equity market and uh, CMU equity market index family was given by the fact that uh, SEPS uh, uh, recently produced uh, um, a report, a study, on the feasibility um, of such an index, such a family index. And based on this, uh, we thought that it would be uh, uh, like an interesting opportunity to, to present some of, of the findings, but above all, having a, a discussion with both uh, representatives of the institutions and market participants about uh, uh, whether such an initiative uh, actually can, can see a way forward, how this uh, can be done, uh, what could be the benefits uh, of it, and uh, to what extent they can contribute to achieve uh, a broader um, policy objective, which is the one of uh, capital markets integration. And to discuss all these issues, uh, we have an excellent uh, panel of speakers. Um, I will go just in alphabetical order. Um, Daika Uzina Milan Kessner, uh, she is the head of the exchange service at Nasdaq Baltic. Hi, Daika. Uh, then William Peter de Kroon is a research fellow and head of financial markets and institutions uh, at SEPS. Um, uh, Joris de Moore is uh, head of quantitative equity fund management at KBC Asset Management. He will be uh, joining us on screen in a moment. And then um, Resvan uh, Dumitrescu is a principal local currency and capital markets development at the EBRD. And then uh, Igor Lonkarski is a professor of finance at the uh, University of Ljubljana and the TS. And then last but not least, uh, Philip Kereman is a head of unit at, at DigiFISMA at the European Commission. So um, given that uh, we have uh, quite a lot of speakers uh, and um, I'm very keen actually in hearing uh, the, um, the, the views and uh, hearing questions from, from the audience, each of the speakers has been assigned a quite uh, small uh, slot for, for, for the presentation. And then I would like to invite everyone to, to ask questions. Uh, this can be done by using the, the Q&A function. Uh, for all of you who are not familiar with Zoom, um, if you just move your cursor in the, um, the lower part of, of your screen, uh, you will have a small icon with the Q&A and please just type in your, your question and then I will take care of uh, uh, passing the message to, uh, to the speakers. And uh, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Igor to, to start uh, with uh, a few um, insights from, from the study about uh, uh, the CMU equity market index family. Igor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Cinzia. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. So to kick off uh, this uh, first part of today's webinar, the uh, presentation, uh, together with William Peter, who will uh, take over for me in a couple of minutes. First, the introduction of maybe some uh, motivation for this study, some uh, key takeaway messages to follow based on the uh, in-depth interviews and survey we conducted among various uh, stakeholders in financial markets. And then uh, William Peter will uh, present the uh, index family the strategy, uh, methodology, and potential interest uh, by the investors uh, gauged by the uh, study and the simulation. So to start with, the starting point, uh, obviously starting from the current situation, since you already mentioned the importance of the CMU initiative, 
But next to this, uh, essentially, if you look at the various markets, uh, capital markets in the EU, especially smaller markets, often uh, classified as, as frontier markets uh, among index providers. And uh, in addition to that, if you look at the companies, uh, small and medium-sized uh, enterprises or companies uh, seem to be neglected and sort of left out from uh, this uh, entire, let's say, uh, uh, public market, capital market uh, story in terms of uh, uh, liquidity, trading, uh, visibility, etc. So. This, uh, the objective of this uh, whole project or the exercise of the CMU index family was twofold. First, to promote the CMU and hence as uh, later on uh, Willem Peter will, uh, will uh, explain, this is where the CMU all share index uh, comes into play. And secondly, given the current situation and, and, and the issues surrounding the current situation, the idea, the approach was to see how to promote uh, SMEs and uh, smaller or let's say neglected uh, CMU uh, markets. And here later on, uh, we'll talk about something called convergence uh, part of this uh, index family. So the reasons for the current situation uh, seem to be uh, various uh, ones. Uh, there is obviously in certain markets and for certain companies uh, limited liquidity. And with limited liquidity, that means any, any trading can have a significant price impact. There is also an issue with the free float in essence might be a very limited free float uh, often uh, at disposal for various uh, public firms and uh, this might have then lead to some concentration issues. There might be various institutional aspects, even though there might be the same rule book for all the EU member states, clearly there are still some cross country differences. And finally, uh, there is unfamiliarity. So if you ask investors and I'll get to a bit more details uh, in a minute, as to why they avoid certain markets on top of all these, uh, or, or firms on top of all these uh, reasons I mentioned, there is also uh, the unfamiliarity. So if they're not familiar with something, if it's, if it's uh, too foreign, they consider it uh, too risky. But liquidity seems to be the main driver of, of this whole story. And liquidity is a bit of a catch 22 that we have to understand. So there might be exogenous and endogenous reasons for liquidity. Clearly we recognize that, you know, um, there might be certain assets or markets that by uh, construction seem to be less, less liquid. However, there are also, and this is what, uh, what, why, why this is now bolded here, this is where the, the whole story about indexes uh, comes into play. The exogenous factors uh, that lead to this uh, catch-22 in liquidity are mostly driven in market classifications. In other words, how certain uh, markets are classified, whether they are developed emerging frontier and whether they are on, on the radar of investors or not, and index inclusion. To what extent are certain markets and companies in the, these markets uh, included? And, you know, often basically it boils down again to the liquidity criteria. So if you're not liquid enough, you're excluded and you might be not liquid because of these exogenous factors. That's why we refer to this as a bit of a catch 22. So why do we focus on, on, on indices? So where, where is here the, the role of the index family? So if you look at the uh, academic research, and I'm going to touch a, a bit on, on the academic side here, uh, as to what happens to firms uh, or, or various uh, markets in aggregate when they become part of, of indices. Well, for the firms, the research so far has shown that there is a positive effect of index inclusion uh, and negative effect on prices uh, and liquidity uh, when it comes to delistings. Now, uh, where do these come from? Two main sources are uh, explanation or theories uh, explained by the supply and demand. And so that's why we talk about demand-based theories, uh, which assume that index inclusion means that index tracking investors simply have to rebalance uh, their portfolios, hence uh, have more demand for such assets that are included in the index. Now this can be either have a transitory, transitory uh, temporary effect or might have a permanent effect. Studies, clear are not, studies here are not clear on that. Depending on markets, depend on the firm sizes, they come to different findings. Second reason for the importance of index inclusion is information-based. So that it might have a positive impact on prices and liquidity because an inclusion of a stock in index conveys some new information about, about the stock. Now, whether it's about signaling, so including index, stock in the index might given the requirements for the inclusion, 
uh, provide signal about good prospects of a firm, uh, liquidity of stocks and so on, might be due to the visibility of a firm once it's in the index becomes more visible or could be due to the positive selection or screening bias uh, when adding uh, stocks to index because there might be an idea that uh, only good stocks are included in the index. So in any case, relying on this backdrop of, of studies, uh, academic studies and their, their conclusions uh, regarding the inclusion of stocks in particular, and then aggregately speaking also markets in, in, in these indexes, indices, this clearly could lead to potential benefits of having a CMU wide index. So increased liquidity of stocks, increased visibility, and hence promoting market development and integration. Uh, just two slides really briefly to graphically show what we, what we meant in the beginning when, when we said that uh, smaller markets and smaller medium-sized enterprises seem to be left out. Now, the, the, this here is basically showing a distribution, geographical distribution across the EU of the market cap of listed companies given their uh, market domicile. So here we have countries, and then uh, at the bottom in brackets, we have a classification of these countries by index providers. D means developed, E emerging, and F frontier. And you see that the market capitalization seems to be very much tilted towards large markets, those that are also then classified as developed. And then in terms of the number of various countries, you see that this long right tail, where there are quite a, few, a lot of countries which are either classified as frontier or emerging, not saying that they have zero market cap, but you know, uh, little, little above zero uh, on, on the aggregate level if we were to look at the entire quote unquote uh, capital market union. So this tells us about the smaller markets being left out. And if you look at the distribution of EU listed companies across the size, in terms of numbers, that's the left-hand uh, bar, you see that 39% are micro 34% small uh, and then 28% mid and large. However, in terms of the, of course, market cap, it's pretty much concentrated and tilted towards large and uh, large firms, a bit left for mid while uh, medium sized, while small and uh, micro firms hardly, hardly uh, show up on this radar. So this is just to motivate this uh, starting point I mentioned before. So to wrap up this uh, first uh, couple of minutes of my introduction, uh, based on the in-depth interviews and then later on the survey we, we ran on, uh, on, on a larger sample, some of the key findings emerged. So first of all, there is a clear divide of interest uh, when it comes to large and mid-cap versus small and uh, micro-cap firms. There is also a relatively clear divide between uh, different types of investors. So uh, clear divide between investors that are very global and those that are more regional or national asset managers. Also a bit of a divide between investors uh, located or coming from developed uh, versus uh, those uh, located coming from emerging and frontier markets. Now, uh, when it comes to use of uh, uh, index provisioning, large investors are more likely to use fee-based independent providers, while smaller seem to revert to free services, obviously explained by assets under management and you know, also the, the cost control. Now, most of the investors prefer independent providers because they trust their uh, reputation and, and know-how. And a bit to start with, a bit disappointing for us was that many, many investors actually said, of course, given the divide I mentioned before, they didn't see real, real need for, for this uh, uh, new CMU index family, given the huge number of indices already in existence that sometimes even surpass the number of uh, available investments because obviously a particular uh, name on the index pops up in many indices, not in a single index. However, they also uh, mentioned that they see further future potential in, in uh, passive investment products that are based on, on, on indices. And of course, uh, further rise in ESG, so environmental, social and governments, sustainability based products. So this is to kick off this conversation and then I'll, uh, Give, my, give the word to Willem Peter, who will take over the presentation for me and uh, explain the strategy, the uh, index compositions, uh, etc. Thank you very much, Igor. So I just shared my screen so that you can also follow the continuation of the presentation. 
So, um, as mentioned, I will briefly go into the concrete uh, index design as we have uh, developed in the context of the feasibility study that was mentioned by uh, Cynthia. So, um, it's important that the CMU index family is a family of indices. So, it has one uh, main headline index being the CMU All Share Index, and that contains uh, all the uh, EU listed and domiciled um, uh, companies um, uh, with a daily liquidity of more than 1,000 1, uh, euros. Uh, and then we also have uh, an index that promotes uh, especially the what, less liquid uh, companies, as that was also a concern as was emphasized by uh, Igor, and that's, they are contained in the CMU Convergence uh, Index. Uh, they, these uh, companies uh, have uh, a daily liquidity between uh, 1,000 and uh, 50,000 uh, euros. Um, and then we have uh, various uh, sub-indices uh, that are either have uh, a thematic uh, or a size or a sectoral uh, nature. Uh, this, to some extent, when it comes to the sectors, uh, is similar, as you see, in, in, in most traditional um, index families. Uh, but the size and thematic uh, indices are also very much there uh, to uh, support the, uh, so basically the, the gaps uh, or the, the, the challenges that uh, Igor just mentioned. Uh, so we see, um, of course, that uh, currently uh, the uh, micro, small uh, companies are, uh, and also smaller uh, markets are underrepresented. So we developed a few uh, sub-indices that capture those um, uh, companies and markets. So there is uh, a micro cap and a small cap, uh, which have uh, stocks uh, with up to uh, 1 billion. Uh, and then you have the uh, CMU SME growth markets. So these are all stocks listed at the uh, SME growth markets. Importantly, uh, when we look at uh, the CMU all share index, we include both uh, the companies listed at regulated markets as well as those listed at uh, SME growth markets. However, of course, at the moment that we put more higher thresholds, for instance, for uh, the capital, the fewer of the constituency companies listed at uh, SME growth markets are included. So then if we then also look at the other size-based uh, indices, that these are the uh, small national capital markets and the mid-national capital markets indices, those contain uh, respectively uh, the capital markets with a total market uh, capitalization of, of less than 15 billion and um, 100 billion. Uh, and that way, uh, in those uh, indices, uh, the, um, the, the companies listed at, at smaller markets are uh, included uh, and get a, a, a relatively uh, bigger share, which is important as we of course know that in the total uh, market capitalization in the EU, they would otherwise have a, a very limited uh, representation. Uh, I won't say much about the, the, the sectoral indices. They reflect very much the distribution of the um, listed companies uh, in the EU. And as you can see uh, on the right-hand side of uh, the screen, for each of the main indices, uh, with uh, a daily liquidity of um, more than uh, 50,000 euros. There's also a convergence uh, index equivalent of um, uh, with uh, companies that are meeting the same criteria, only having a daily liquidity between 1,000 and 50,000 euros. This way you have um, an index family with over um, 30 indices. You see also some numbers in the uh, index that is that we consider that the index could be launched at once or in phases, uh, and then uh, uh, the uh, CMU All Share Index would be the first one to be launched, followed by the Convergence Index, and then followed by uh, the various sub indices, and, and last the ESG Index. Why last? Not because of the potential, but more because methodologically that one is the most difficult to. Um, established because you will need to know more about the company in particular its activities. Our ESG index is uh, designed in line with the uh, Paris um, agreed benchmark, so uh, contributing to a reduction in uh, greenhouse gas emissions and other emissions of 50%. Uh, 
Um, it follows, uh, as uh, you can see the, also in the more detailed methodology in the study, uh, a quite simple methodology for the moment based on the sectors uh, the companies are active. Uh, but over time, this could become um, more based on the real activities of the companies. Uh, but the uh, data for that is currently being uh, yeah, uh, prepared uh, with uh, the work that also is uh, initiated by uh, uh, the Commission and, um, and others. So in that sense, also this um, designed index might develop over time. So that over about the uh, indices included in the CMU index family. If we then move to the main uh, elements, so um, we already uh, noted that there are around three and a half thousand uh, companies included in the CMU All Share Index, uh, but there are in total um, four and a half thousand uh, listed companies uh, that are also domiciled uh, in the uh, EU. Um, so there are around a thousand that we found that didn't meet the minimum uh, daily liquidity. Um, what else is important? Um, of course, uh, there are certain uh, quality criteria set by uh, investors in terms of uh, the uh, size of the, uh, the way you weight and you determine the index. The most used one is uh, uh, index weighted based on the market capitalization. And that's also what we did. And uh, that market capitalization is adjusted for uh, the free float. Uh, and that's very much in line with most of the, uh, the larger uh, indices that are being uh, uh, used for benchmark and uh, tra tracking. Um, then in the way uh, the indices are uh, calculated, we offer the most convenient or the most common uh, ways of calculation, so both uh, so gross return, net return, and uh, price indices are provided. Also in the way we uh, propose that the uh, indices are revised, there are the usual um, six months uh, revision periods and uh, some uh, unannounced revisions are uh, implemented immediately. And uh, ideally also the uh, prices for the index are provided uh, continuously and in real time uh, as most of the uh, larger indices uh, are, are being provided uh, at the moment. So it was briefly about uh, the methodology. If we then move uh, to the uh, potential, um, first we, we did it in, in, in two different ways. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we did a mapping of the existing investments by um, EU investors in uh, mutual funds as well as in uh, ETFs. Uh, and based on that, we got an idea of where uh, the current investments uh, are going related to uh, uh, indices, of course. Um, and this uh, figure shows that. What you basically see that the largest uh, index that attracts a significant amount of investments has uh, 3,000 constituents. Uh, the CMU All Share Index would have around two, uh, three, uh, three and a half thousand uh, constituents. So basically, it's it's uh, unlikely, uh, given the size, to attract uh, much investments, or at least that there are uh, many investors that will uh, replicate uh, the uh, the index. That does not mean that the, uh, the uh, investors would not do it in a different way. Uh, we, for instance, know that of the CMU All Share Index, uh, the uh, 800 companies um, that uh, have the largest uh, market uh, capitalization, um, so that's roughly 25% uh, of the total number of companies included, they represent around 96% uh, of the total uh, index weight. So already, uh, if then replicated, it might well be uh, that uh, only the larger companies uh, would be uh, selected. But of course, then you would not necessarily meet the objectives of the uh, index value. We are also promoting uh, the investments in, in the smaller uh, markets and uh, smaller stocks. Good. Moving to the next. So we, based on uh, the data exercise, but also the, the, the survey that was already mentioned by uh, Igor, uh, we did uh, an estimation of what the maximum uh, investments uh, in a CMU index family could be by 
uh, subindices. Um, however, we always need to be uh, quite um, yeah, careful in, in interpreting these results. So we asked the investors what the maximum would be allocating. Uh, so, but for that, all the conditions should be uh, right. And then you speak about the governance of the index, the quality of the index provider setting up the index, but also the marketing that is uh, uh, done in order to attract uh, investors, uh, as well as to make it attractive for, uh, for instance, the um, ETF providers or fund providers to use the index. Also, the pricing uh, would be uh, something uh, important uh, to consider. Now, if all these conditions are in a most preferable um, condition, so most preferable state, this index family could attract several hundreds of billion of uh, investments. In reality, we uh, expect it to be uh, less uh, because it's unlikely that all the conditions will be met. But nevertheless, if you then look at the different types of indices, you see clearly that uh, based on investors, there's most potential for uh, uh, an ESG-related uh, uh, index. Of course, we also have seen in, with the uh, latest indices that are being launched and also most of the products that there is a growing uh, interest from uh, investors in investing in, in ESG. So that's also reflected uh, in that potential that is well be above uh, the uh, current level of investments in similar, uh, yeah, in, 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 in also ESG or uh, green uh, indices that are already uh, available. So, uh, I think that's the, the main, in, in other indices, uh, you, you see that it, it, it's uh, also in, the, in normal indices, uh, investments, it's, it's slightly uh, less. So moving to uh, the uh, types of investors that would be interested, uh, we clearly see uh, that um, primarily uh, regional and to a lesser extent uh, domestic oriented uh, institutional investors would be interested uh, in investing in uh, the CMU uh, index and its sub uh, indices. Um, those uh, investors uh, indicate uh, that at the moment they are not necessarily served uh, by the um, currently available uh, index uh, providers as well uh, as the global investors that in, uh, the large majority of them says that they have no uh, real uh, interest in investing in a CMU uh, uh, index uh, family, uh, also because they indicate that if they would like to invest in such a family uh, or would like to have uh, an index uh, as such, they would uh, just ask these uh, providers to um, to build it for them and they would uh, do it uh, already for them. And so far, they didn't feel uh, the need for it. But nevertheless, there are these domestic and regional investors. If you then look at the, at the uh, location of them, you see that these uh, domestic and regional investors are primarily located more towards the, uh, the, the, the eastern part uh, of, of Europe. Um, in, in, in the western part, uh, you see that there is clearly uh, less of an interest, uh, as also there, of course, we, we know that the uh, more globally oriented investors are located. So this was briefly uh, an overview of the uh, index uh, strategy and the index uh, methodology, as well as the uh, potential. Uh, in the study, we also looked at, uh, for instance, the, the governance and the performance of the index. This is something we can uh, explore in the uh, Q&A uh, uh, if there are uh, questions about it. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Igor. Many thanks, uh, William Peter. All those who are interested in, in the report and uh, uh, many more details, uh, because the, the report is actually quite thick, you can find it on, on uh, SEP's uh, website and it can be downloaded for free. Um, I mean, this study was uh, uh, commissioned by the European Commission, who, who wanted to have an independent study on the feasibility of, of the index. So I'm now turning to uh, Philip Kerman uh, to hear from um, his point of view what are actually the, the main takeaways from, from this report uh, and also to, uh, to ask whether this, uh, um, uh, this idea can be um, uh, to some extent connected to the more general initiatives of, of the European Commission. Philip, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Cynthia, and thank you, uh, Seps, 
for organizing this uh, event and uh, drawing uh, attention to this uh, action ongoing in the Commission, exploring to what extent an equity index can contribute to uh, CMU. And it is in that context that uh, we have uh, commissioned uh, this uh, feasibility study. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Um, I would like to uh, dwell on uh, two points. Uh, first, uh, that local capital market uh, development is an important lack of the CMU uh, project. And it is in that context that uh, we see a contribution for an equity index. I have two slides on that. And then the, the next point is um, uh, that I would like to pass is um, how can such a, a CMU index uh, contribute to the development of uh, the project of uh, Capital Markets Union and what could be the role of the Commission uh, therein. So let me start by uh, drawing the attention that uh, the CMU action plan started in 2015 and it became very clear and explicit that, in to that uh, local capital market development uh, was important in the communication on the C uh, CMU midterm review, where there was even a priority action requesting the Commission to uh, develop a uh, strategy for uh, local capital market uh, development by the second quarter of 2018. In the communication on the CMU uh, progress uh, report, uh, there again, it was emphasized that uh, boosting local capital markets is a major goal of capital markets uh, union. Uh, references are made to uh, benefits for medium-sized enterprises, uh, geographical proximity, lowest transaction cost, um, uh, promoting and using uh, local um, savings. Uh, all elements emphasized. Uh, one facilitates also integration of uh, capital markets if one starts from a certain uh, level. That's also an important motivation to pay also attention to the smaller markets and smaller companies. And it is in that communication of uh, March uh, 2019 that the strategy on for local capital market um, uh, development was exposed with um, requiring action at national, regional, and um, EU uh, level. Next page, uh, please. A further, um, so far, um, an equity index was not explicitly mentioned as a tool to um, arrive at promoting a CMU or local capital market developments of smaller um, companies. It became very explicit in the CMU high level forum that the Commission organized. It was a reflection forum on uh, developing uh, or relaunching uh, capital market uh, integration and, and CMU. And um, in a recommendation of a subgroup, it uh, was explicitly mentioned that uh, the Commission should um, study um, the possibility uh, how uh, greater visibility could be given to uh, smaller uh, companies via uh, inclusion in an index. And um, the study that we uh, commissioned or that we launched um, uh, has that as uh, background. And um, a new a CMU action plan is in preparation, um, translating some of uh, these um, recommendations of the CMU uh, high level uh, forum. The focus in this action plan is, however, on um, regulatory uh, and uh, legal uh, initiatives. Next slide, uh, please. How um, can uh, CMU be promoted by uh, via an equity index? Uh, Igor um, already uh, very clearly indicated it. Uh, it would be a concrete representation of CMU. 
there is no good uh, index representing the capital markets of um, uh, the 27 uh, member states. Um, the existing indices uh, include uh, non-EU uh, member states and only a limited uh, amount of countries and um, uh, companies. I understand that because of uh, liquidity and trading issues, uh, some trade-offs are there for the inclusion, uh, but still uh, one can go there a bit uh, further. And the second uh, element is um, uh, by inclusion in an index, one can promote um, uh, visibility and uh, improve um, uh, investment in these uh, smaller companies. So one develops a local uh, capital market. What I would like to emphasize is that there are now, uh, in particular, some opportunities. Um, because of the growing importance of uh, the index tracking, uh, the inclusion of some forgotten stocks, to which already Igor uh, alluded, um, a particular element is the low interest rate environment. Um, and when there is a search for yields, um, uh, equity comes uh, or the, gets uh, more attention. Mobilization, it's also linked to the low interest rate environment, mobilization of bank savings. Um, and there is a potential to invest more in the EU because uh, one of the findings of uh, the study is also that uh, some of the uh, bigger investment and, and uh, indices have um, uh, also non-EU uh, companies and uh, shares. And then there is the uh, issue of Brexit, which makes a uh, dedicated uh, uh, index for the EU um, increasingly more important. Let me put it like that. Uh, for instance, uh, Germany has the DAX, uh, France has CAC 40 and so on. Uh, all national stock markets have a dedicated uh, index. Why not the, uh, why not CMU and uh, um, representing the EU 27 uh, countries? What is the role of uh, the Commission in this uh, project? What is the justification of um, its involvement? Essentially, uh, the market failure, uh, trying to overcome the catch-22 to which uh, Igor already alluded, uh, by inclusion, more visibility, um, having also more trading, and as a consequence, um, more investment and development in the markets. What is now the concrete follow-up study, the concrete follow-up to uh, the feasibility study uh, by uh, SEPS? An important conclusion uh, reached in the study is that uh, based on the present constellation of uh, the uh, private uh, market uh, index providers, the index that we have in mind and sketched by um, Willem uh, will not uh, come into existence. Uh, along the study, we have had um, several workshops and seminars with investors, with uh, index providers, and uh, somehow um, so that they, they know about our interest, but um, it doesn't seem uh, coming to existence. So that is one finding of the study. And then the suggestion is uh, by SEPS, uh, organize um, an implementation task force looking for public and private partners willing to create such an CMU index. And that's where we are. Um, in the task force are um, uh, the commission, also the, the uh, EBRD, uh, our longstanding partner in this uh, project, and also SEPS um, advises how we could uh, proceed. And um, that's where we are at this uh, moment. Um, so uh, trying to 
bring uh, further this project via uh, the implementation task force. I will stop here. Thank you. Many thanks, Philip. So maybe all those who are following this uh, this webinar, if you're interested in joining the task force, uh, I think you know who, who you should uh, reach out to. Um, I'm now passing the floor to Rezvan. Um, as Philip said, the EBRD has been one of the partners in, in this project. The EBRD has been very supportive of capital market integration in Europe in general, so also uh, beyond the, the, the EU borders. I will now give the floor to, to Razvan to, to bring in uh, maybe some um, uh, views and uh, uh, also what the EBRD is, is doing in, in this sense. Please, the floor is yours. Sure. Thank you, Chinzia. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. It's always a pleasure to, to, to brainstorm and also uh, foster our partnership uh, in terms of capital market development. Uh, well, this is a timely report and initiative by all means. Uh, it occurs at a time when we are witnessing two major trends increasing ESG asset allocation, ranging from billions to trillions, depending on the source, and also increasing uh, passive or index uh, fund investment. In the US, I think there's like $2.8 trillion or 50% of uh, the equity share, uh, whereas in the Europe, uh, that share is about 16%. So that provides you a hint that uh, today I'll actually pitch for the CMU ESG index. So there's where I would bet uh, that I see the, the strongest interest and also the case. Why? Well, first of all, the EU has the potential and the opportunity to create a capital market that differentiates itself by integrating ESG standards at the product level. Secondly, we do have the EU Green Deal and also the Action Plan, uh, which includes developing sustainability benchmarks. In this case, a CMU ESG index would perfectly match that uh, criteria. And also there is ongoing push for ESG disclosures and indicators, which puts the EU and the CMU at the forefront when you look at the global level developments. But it's also important to see where we stand. And in that respect, I do feel that an index needs to be investable and replicable, uh, just to ignite the interests of both regional, but also global uh, investors, because at the end of the day, they, they have the capa capacity to move uh, uh, the trillions we're discussing about. This means that at an initial stage, maybe not all EU jurisdictions can be represented, but of course they'll form part of the screening process. And that should also act as an incentive for uh, the local markets in, uh, in the CMU in the EU to push for local ESG champions to be included in such CMU ESG index. So there's this part of uh, the incentive of the motivational part. And of course, for our time, it also, I think it can be uh, addressed the EU ESG data uh, repository, which I think it's uh, uh, a common uh, a common issue that we all face, and uh, it will be done in, in time. I'm, I'm confident about it. And all this brings us to one ongoing project uh, that we've been lobbying with uh, uh, our colleagues from the European Commission, also with uh, NASDAQ uh, Baltics, and also with uh, the Ministry of Finance in, uh, uh, in in the Baltics, and that's to achieve a pan-Baltic single classification. Uh, that's a region basically of three member states um, having frontier market status, and we do aim to have one single classification. And why do I say that? Well, um, it's basically to, to leverage on the strengths on uh, the Baltic states and also can be a template for the EU, for the CMU. Uh, I'm not sure how many colleagues here and uh, distinguished guests would know that uh, there is a track record that developed markets in the EU and the Western African Economic Monetary Union are seen by index providers like MSCI as single pots of equity. So they are seen as one single classification. So that's an opportunity and also regulatory loophole. So why not having the same approach to the CMU, having seen all uh, the markets as one single market classification. And that if achieved, and that should be straightforward in there, uh, automatically you have an index uh, emerging because once you have a market classification, you have an index on a country, on a region, and, and, and so on. So actually, if we, if we think about it, there are actually two solutions. Either we launch directly an index such as the CMU ESG index, or we promote and lobby for having one single CMU status. And that would automatically provide you an index in, uh, in that respect. And I was even reading with, uh, with pleasure a few days ago when uh, one index provider, actually the leading index provider, acknowledging that the regional CMU approach captures a wider opportunity 
set uh, with smaller but still investable stocks. So they understand and they're aware of uh, the diversification benefit. And I think that's something that we should leverage on and go back to them and, uh, and try to see how we can, uh, we can promote uh, this part. And uh, maybe just, uh, I'm, I'm mindful of the time. I even uh, had a quick motto uh, that I sketch in the morning uh, and it goes like that. Uh, we have a CMU vision. There is an ESG mission. Let there be the CMU ESG index cohesion. So uh, yeah, on uh, that note, I do still hope and uh, looking forward to uh, for all the partnerships here and uh, colleagues to, uh, to, to shape such uh, CMU ESG index. And I think there's never been a better time than, uh, than nowadays. Thank you, Chesia. Thank you, Rasban. Thank you also for the slogan. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, now I think it's, it's time to, to, to hear the views of, of, of the markets. Uh, I mean, I think it was repeated uh, uh, several times. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, EU companies are listed in about 5,000 index, indices, but there is no CNU index. Uh, I, I think a number of, of reasons for this have, have been mentioned. Uh, but uh, I think it's now interesting in time to, to hear from uh, Daiga and, and Joris um, uh, how they're looking at, the, at this initiative. Daiga, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Cinti. And also thank you, Razvan, for excellent uh, introduction into the topic. Yes, indeed, I represent NASDAQ Baltic. So this is a market which is comprised of three EU states, Latvia, Latvia, Estonia. And we are a small regional market, but I would say that we are the only truly regional market because our trading part and also post-trade part are fully integrated. There are no other markets like that in Europe. So the, our market cap is around 10 billion euro and most of companies obviously, obviously are SMEs. But what we have seen in last couple of years, we, we have seen the interest from private sector, from government, to list the companies and develop capital markets. For example, next week, uh, hopefully, the largest IPO in Baltics ever will take place. Lithu Lithuanian energy company will float the shares. But still, so three countries, we are all in EU, we are in NATO, we are OECD member states, we are in Eurozone. However, if we look at the classification, for example, by MSCI, Estonia and Lithuania are under uh, classified as frontier markets. Latvia is not classified at all. So basically, uh, frontier market means that uh, Estonia and Lithuania, given the EU, NATO, OECD, what I named, are together with Kuwait, Vietnam, Morocco, Bahrain, and Nigeria. And exactly, we have had a lot of discussions in, with international index providers and there really isn't any good reason that uh, we have been said why they cannot look at us as a region. And uh, no, except that we have three different uh, supermarket supervisors. The rest is the same. And exactly like Razvan was saying, in West Africa, there is one approach. And in with three European countries, there is completely different approach. And the problem so seemingly is the fact that three FSAs are supervising, regardless of the fact that we are all sort of have implemented EU directives and so on and so on. So I think it's just an interesting uh, fact that you are, should be aware of. And I, I think uh, this uh, sort of CMU index is a very important initiative and I believe in it uh, because it first of all can improve uh, SME and small markets visibility it can promote cross-border flow of investment, and of course also reduce market fragmentation. And all of those are exactly the goals of CMU. And I think that if we sort of have this regional approach, for example, Baltics or, or uh, European Union at large, it actually can facilitate the regional cooperation of small exchanges. Because I think it is the only way how the capital markets in those small countries can develop. It's regional cooperation. And this indexation would be a great boost uh, to motivate uh, exchanges to uh, think more about this cooperation. So I also believe that this CMU index seeks to respond to market failure 
And actually, it can break this vicious circle where small markets suffer, suffer from limited visibility, which lead to limited liquidity and investment. And uh, in index inclusion is obviously very, very important for investment flows. So we are uh, really highly supporting this initiative, and we see that that can really lead to some positive development of CMU, because I also think that Capital Markets Union is as strong as the weakest link. So it's not about big markets getting bigger. It's about small markets catching up. And this is one of the steps that can be taken. Thank you. Thanks very much, Taiga. And then last but not least, Joris, the view of an investor. Please, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Can you still hear me? Yes. OK, good. Um... You'll have to share it. Uh, yeah, okay, because I did not have, I wasn't able to participate in the proper way. Can you um, just speak a little bit louder, please? Yes, um, wait, I will just try to see if I can do something about this. Does this already make a difference? This is good? Okay, perfect. So um, I would like to turn into a topic which is important from an investor perspective. Uh, my name is Joris de Moor. I work for KBC. Um, it's a bench and asset manager. Um, I'm one of the senior portfolio managers in the equity space with a focus on model-based portfolio management. This includes uh, index and quantitative investments. So I'm starting with a simple statement that is liquidity, liquidity generates liquidity. Yeah? It, uh, for me, it means actually there is an evolution of liquidity in the market. I do believe personally that indexing or the, um, the availability of an index indeed plays a role, but I think it's also important to realize that the index not necessarily is the starting point. So can we move to the next slide, please? So um, if you look at the market participants, well, maybe first we'd like to go back to the initial objective of this exercise, uh, at least how I understood it. That is, we have local companies, smaller companies, mid-sized companies that are looking for growth and would like to grow as a company through capital market equity issues. To be very clear, these are primary market issues. I'm going to explain this uh, from a fund manager perspective. Many international fund managers will um, gain access to a local market in a passive way uh, because it's impossible to, have to, to investigate, to analyze all the markets in detail. So typically uh, to smaller markets or markets that are distant, we apply um, a passive approach. But when you apply a passive approach, you're not going to participate to IPOs, not going to participate to capital increases. So the primary issue is actually you're not going to influence. So on the other hand, the companies are still looking for parties that are willing to participate to these IPOs. So the success of the real objective, I think, of this exercise is the availability of active managers in the region. Now, obviously, active and passive managers have some things in common. Right? They look for low costs, efficient markets, liquidity, right? but uh, liquidity it always comes back. Liquidity is a very special and difficult thing. I would like to explain on the next slide um, where I have something prepared, which is called, let's say, the market liquidity evolution. Uh, this graph is purely illustrative. It's to explain the concept. And I'm going already to start in the middle. In the middle, you have a market that has already reached a particular level of liquidity. Because as a passive investor, I want to make sure that there is enough liquidity in the market. Because if there's an index change, if I have an allocation change, I do not want to face big differences in allocation or face fees, indirect costs, or whatever. So in the middle, what you see is at the moment there is already a lot of liquidity or like a decent level of liquidity, then the index, I think, will really work as an accelerator. Because at that moment, of course, the index is needed by those investors to start trading, to define the desired exposure on the market. It means at that moment, those passive investors are going to add additional liquidity to the market, and the market becomes, again, more attractive for um, active managers, and those are the ones that are involved in primary issues. And even when those are back, you will see that the more mature markets and the are are great big investors are coming and the high frequency traders and so on. But the big question is here for me, how do you get to this first point 
where passive investors get really interested in the market. So how do you get to this first level of liquidity? And I think the index itself is not going to print. So can we go to the last slide, please? So uh, to come to this first level of liquidity, yeah, the thing is, of course, someone has to start trading. How can you get this initial liquidity? How can you get an initial number of active managers in the market that have, uh, that have different opinions? So start buying um, in an active context. And there, I think you have three groups of accelerators. I'm not going to mention them all, uh, they're on the slides. But uh, about the market, uh, we mentioned it already, uh, custodians, low costs, market regulation, all important. But the companies themselves, I think that's also what we should focus on. To make the market attractive to investors, you have to make sure you have a set of companies that's attractive for investors. And those companies should comply with a few conditions. Those companies should really be controlled by the, um, by the public. Yeah? So controlling shareholders are not attractive for international active managers. Yeah? You should have coverage by the market by brokers, independent brokers. Yeah? Your active manager should be able to directly interact with the company management. Of course, language is often a burden, but that makes a big difference for an asset manager. Your data, and I'm talking about both structured and unstructured data, should be available in a language understood by the active manager. But we know we're talking about maybe 10 countries, different languages, different tech regulation, different local regulation often. So we need to get some standardization, some internationalization of, on the information so that active manager has access to all the relevant information. And of course, that makes a big difference. So we're discussing this with our um, senior um, active uh, managers in the company. And for them, if those conditions are complied, even a company without an index becomes attractive. And in them, those managers will create the first liquidity I think that's needed in the market before passive investors are willing to step in. And uh, for those companies, of course, uh, we need additional accelerators. Uh, and uh, one accelerator that's often used in the region is a foreign listing. Uh, so you have several companies that go already for a, a UK listing or a US listing. That, of course, helps just to create promotion for the market. And of course, uh, sometimes the uh, overall market events a market promotion. Uh, we talk about the Olympic Games in Greece, for example, uh, several years ago. They also increase the overall appetite. But I think the index, good idea. But watch out, it's, the index itself will not trigger, well, to my opinion, a real boost in the liquidity. That was what I would like to illustrate. Thanks very much, um, Joris. Okay, we finished the first round of, of intervention. I would like to invite everyone who has a question to, to type it in in the Q&A uh, function. I have uh, actually one person who, who uh, wrote a question uh, at the beginning, uh, so he has been uh, or she has been very uh, patient. I would like to to address the the, the, the question. The question is, uh, how would you promote convergence indices to, to attract investors instead of main indices? Uh, who would like to take the the question? Uh, if, if Igor is not taking it, I can take it. Um, of course, uh, it, it, it's, it's always difficult to attract uh, investments in, in less liquid uh, stocks. Um, I think there, uh, what we see uh, also in uh, uh, traditional investment theory, that uh, in general, there are uh, higher returns for uh, stocks that are, don't have the, the, say, preferred profile. So in this case, if they have uh, less liquidity in general, you would see, and I think we also found that in, in the study, that uh, this index is likely to have a higher return than the uh, main index, or at least uh, quite a few of the convergence and also the main uh, convergence index. So that would be uh, an important uh, reason to invest in it. And of course, it needs to be uh, an investor that has a longer term uh, profile because of course it's much uh, less easy to get in and out at the moment that you replicate uh, this index. So I think that's the main answer to that. Uh, many thanks, Willem. Um, for the moment, there is no other question, but uh, maybe what I would like to suggest is that uh, Joris stressed a lot the, 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 the liquidity element uh, and that the fact that the, the index would have uh, only, if you want, a marginal or partial vote. Anyone would like to, to react to, to his point? Maybe, Ratvan? 
Sure, thank you, thank you, Chinzi. And um, yeah, that was a, that was a fair point, and uh, I do think that the European Commission is doing the the right uh, uh, actions. Uh, we we do have uh, EU SME IPO fund, uh, which basically is now an advisory project to see how such template could uh, could work, and of course also ourselves uh, EBRD together with uh, European Commission. And also uh, with other partners in uh, in the Baltics, we are looking to design a capital markets development accelerator fund, uh, especially to act on the on the primary market uh, when when tapping that. So there are various initiatives that actually work together to to create this uh, system. There are also in terms of uh, different projects on pre-listing support, uh, on uh, research coverage, uh, and 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 so on. So there are multiple parts of the puzzle. But I think um, when uh, speaking the EU, uh, I think what we should bear in mind is that, uh, uh, at least what I see, is that markets such as the US or in Asia, they are growing at a, fast, at a, fa a faster pace compared to, to the EU, even like the, the more developed markets in here. So unless you actually bundle together and try to, to leverage on the synergies, uh, be it on the frontier, develop or emerging markets, so just be seen as one region, uh, actually, everyone is losing out. It's, that's that's the reality. Uh, I'm looking now in the emerging market space where 40% uh, of one index it's uh, is China, uh, whereas uh, countries like Poland, which is uh, emerging markets, uh, losing out or, or other parts. So, if you want to remain uh, significant, be it active or passive in the EU, uh, you need to have a better approach in terms of uh, more regional integration, uh, which uh, I, I do believe in uh, that the CMU can can address. Uh, yeah. And that's uh, that's all for me for now. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else who would like to to react to, to any of the points uh, raised by the colleagues in, in the panel? Yeah. So maybe just to add to what Yoris mentioned. So in the beginning, when I started this discussion with starting points, I did emphasize that there is there are endogenous and exogenous reasons for the liquidity. So the index addresses the exogenous part, and what Yoris mentioned was really the endogenous. What is bizarre recently is just a couple of days ago, I could read about blank check companies. You have markets in which basically investors give like blank checks, money to companies which not, don't even have a business plan, don't even exist, like special purpose vehicles. So then you start to ask yourself, what is then the purpose of the market, right? So where do other real companies uh, sit with that respect? So I think it, it is important part, of course, the endogenous part. But we need to, of course, what this, uh, what we, what we try to address here is this uh, uh, exogenous uh, view on the liquidity. Anyone else? Uh, maybe let, let me then put a, a, another question on the, on the table. I mean, assume that uh, we find a way to 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 get the index, the, the family index. Who do you think will benefit most from the creation of of the index? And second point. Um, do you think it will uh, bring uh, broad capital equity market in integration at EU level or rather the benefits would remain uh, concentrated? Anyone? Would maybe, like to... maybe I can uh, start on, on that. Um, the CMU index, at least the way that we envisage it, is to target the smaller companies and the smaller markets. So I would say they are the primary uh, beneficiaries of it. But also I would say on the retail investment side, um, savers um, put too much their uh, money into banks in low uh, return uh, assets. If there would be a broader equity culture, in the EU, and um, it's one of the um, aims also of uh, the CMU uh, action plan, then um, if one can offer uh, safe, uh, well-diversified, uh, stable equity investments, then also um, the retail investor may benefit from uh, this initiative. So there was lots of talk about smaller markets and smaller companies, but I think um, also from the retail investment side, uh, there are uh, there could be advantages in this uh, CMU index. Thanks. Anyone else would like to uh, to add uh, on this? Um, otherwise, uh, there are a couple of questions from uh, attendees. 
So the, the first one is uh, who will be responsible for the implementation of uh, DSCMU indices? So it's, it's more about the governance. Uh, this is an aspect which has been uh, is addressed actually in, in, in the report, but uh, we didn't really discuss. Um, I don't know if Willem Igor would like to say something on this to start with, and then also the other can, can contribute. Willem Igor? Yeah, I so um, in the report, we, we identify uh, and we also explain a couple of these uh, issues. Uh, or did we explain them today? That there are obviously reasons why the market sort of quote unquote fails with that respect uh, when it comes to covering uh, all the let's say smaller markets and smaller companies. So the implementation obviously calls for what was already briefly mentioned, sort of like a, a public private uh, partnership. So clearly the commission is in no position and, and, and uh, by construction that uh, should take care of the index, but uh, it's in a position to basically promote the index and look for mechanisms. That's why the task force, how to uh, jumpstart it, uh, jumpstart the idea and implementation. It would definitely be implemented by one of the existing providers, but uh, given uh, what we already mentioned, who is the you know most obvious beneficiary here, and 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 given that it's about the CMU, uh, certain initial support, uh, public support uh, will be uh, will be needed. Maybe. There is actually another question, which is the follow up, and then I uh, give you the floor to others. The, the, the other question is: Will uh, the, the Commission be responsible and finance the implementation? Which I think is very much related to, to the previous point. Maybe um, I can uh, step in on, on, on this point. Um, the Commission is a public institution, an international public institution, and can only have as its uh, objective public policy goals and what are these in this uh, context? First, an expression to CMU capital markets or an appropriate index. So far, there isn't. And second, local capital market developments. These are the public goals that the Commission has and, and try to foster by drawing uh, attention that's we do not have these two goals um, realized. On the other hand, we are very much aware that there is a private index business. There are great commercial interest in uh, calculating an index, uh, getting a fee uh, for it. And um, the commission should shy away from that. Uh, there are all kinds of issues uh, of um, interfering in market uh, competition. One should stay away from that, that's very clear. And the Commission should also stay away in being an investor, investment advisor. It's not the business of the Commission. So one should maneuver here very clearly or very um, uh, prudently, uh, focusing only on the public goals and not serve any private uh, interest. So um, as there is huge financial and commercial interest, at this moment, the Commission thinks that it is not their role to give finance for implementing such an index. Um, given the fact that there are so many indices, we think that maybe um, public-private partnership or some initiatives uh, by private index providers may come up with such an index. Let's hope uh, you're exploring uh, this. On the other hand, we like to uh, give our support uh, to the development of such an index because we see it contributing to some uh, or to basically two uh, goals of uh, public interest. So um, that uh, is uh, our role in, in, in this conflict. Thank you. Rasman, would you like to compliment? Yes, actually, I would like to stress a few developments that emerged during the pandemic. One of them being that certain leading index administrators, they postponed the rebalancing of indices, especially fixed income indices during the pandemic. So treat that as a market failure. And secondly, two peer emerging markets uh, banned short selling throughout the pandemic. But the leading index provider had different uh, approach to, to their cases, which to me, it means there is either a regulatory loophole 
for something that needs to be addressed. And uh, I, I, I've seen recently the French Securities Commission coming out with a paper questioning the power and influence and the actual role uh, of index providers. Um, so I think it's also a time to scrutinize more and not take for granted ser several uh, several parts in uh, in this part uh, in terms of uh, the indices. And uh, one specific case, as also Daiga kindly mentioned, is the Western African Monetary Union and developed markets in the EU. It's been seen as single pots of equities compared to, to other markets. And uh, to me, it's again, one of those uh, outstanding points that uh, uh, nobody tried to, to address from the index uh, index provider side. And uh, hopefully maybe some of the attendees here are from the index uh, business to take it on board and maybe address in, uh, in a timely part. And one last part, I think last year in uh, January, uh, one of the indices, MSCI, had a public uh, disclosure saying, look, such an approach might be feasible in the EU. But one and a half year later, nothing happened. So yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, maybe um, just to, to follow up on, um, you mentioned COVID and uh, before um, uh, Philippe mentioned Brexit, I mean, for financial markets, uh, these two events are, are quite big. One question is whether uh, Brexit saw the exit of uh, the, the largest capital market of, of the EU and now what is going on with, with COVID. Do you think uh, these two events are creating a context where there is uh, uh, more need, if you want, uh, and more and higher likelihood actually that uh, such an index uh, uh, could find support or not necessarily? Maybe I can no. kick off. Um, uh, first on, on Brexit, uh, I think Brexit is an opportunity to create such an index. If one looks at the major uh, cross-country indices, uh, covering Europe, uh, typically uh, UK is in there, also some uh, non-EU countries. Um, one can wonder if uh, one should not have um, an EU27 uh, uh, index uh, and typically with a wider coverage than the ones which are available uh, now. So I would say definitely uh, Brexit is an opportunity. Then on uh, COVID, um, COVID is now uh, finding remedies to overcome uh, the COVID disaster. We have to formulate them now. And at the moment, we do not have yet this uh, CMU index. So I would say in the short term, it will not have too much of an impact. But I see uh, yeah, opportunities in the medium term if one can mobilize more uh, equity investment uh, in uh, Europe, then uh, this is uh, positive for the recovery and uh, resilience because just um, tapping uh, the recovery and resilience uh, facility, the public funding which is made available at European or national level will not be uh, enough. One needs to have uh, it complemented by uh, private investment and there, in the medium term, a um, CMU index could, could play a role. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, um, we have reached uh, 5.15 p.m. Uh, yeah, at least here in Brussels, uh, and um, it is time to, to close. I want to thank very much uh, all the participants, uh, speakers, uh, but also uh, attendees uh, and uh, who have asked questions. I hope we will have the opportunity to discuss again uh, this topic uh, in the near future, uh, possibly uh, about some, some developments. Uh, many thanks and I wish you a good evening. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, nice Bye-bye.